So tonight's webinar is called Tips for Parents of Students with uh, ADHD Returning to School During COVID and is hosted by the Center for ADHD Awareness Canada uh, or CADAC for short. So CADAC is a national charity dedicated to the awareness, education and advocacy for um, ADHD. And this webinar will be about one hour long. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the chat room at the bottom of the screen and uh, we will answer them at the end of the presentation. Our speaker tonight is Heidi Bernard and she is the founder of CADAC and has served as our national director from 2005 to, 2000 and to 2012 and as our executive director and president until the end of last year, 2019. Um, she for the past 28 years, she has helped raise awareness, understanding of ADHD among parents and uh, educators, healthcare professionals, and the government as well. So with that said, I'll pass the time to Heidi tonight. Thank you, Heidi. Thanks, Fiona. Good evening, everyone, and thanks for joining us uh, uh, for tonight's presentation. Uh, we've received a lot of uh, email and calls from parents who are quite concerned about their kids with ADHD returning to school during these unique times. So we thought it uh, would be very good for our stakeholders to have the opportunity to hear a presentation on um, a lot of different topics on, uh, you know, on this. So we're going to be talking about some of the new challenges your kids are going to be uh, facing, why these are going to be uh, particularly challenging for our kids. Um, we're going to be discussing some questions you need to be asking the schools, some things you need to request from your child's school. We're going to be talking a little bit about ex uh, school exclusion, what this is, why you need to know about it. Um, and we're also going to be talking about some ways to assist your child with transitioning back to school before they get into school or at the beginning. Uh, obviously, the more you can do before they, they get into the classroom, better, the better. And uh, also, we're going to be talking about some uh, tips on preparing the school for your child going, uh, going back and then uh, just touch on some resources. So new challenges. So let's talk about new challenges. Uh, the box is back again, but okay. So all kids going back to school um, that are going to be faced with a new reality. But for those students with neurodevelopmental disorders, this environment is going to be significantly more challenging. And why is that? So the skills um, that are impaired will be the very skills or the skills that the disorder, ADHD, or whatever the other neurodevelopmental disorder is, um, that are impaired are the very skills that they're going to uh, have to access um, to be able to be successful in this environment. So things like the ability to pay attention and not be distracted. When these kids are faced with a brand new environment, a lot more rules and regulations, um, different schedules, um, all kinds of things they're going to have to remember about staying seven feet away from everybody else, not touching other people's belongings, you can see how their ability um, to focus and not be distracted is going to cause issues they very often have difficulty paying attention to details. And unfortunately, this is going to be an environment that's going to bombard them with details. There's going to be a lot more complex instructions to follow. And these instructions probably will have a lot of different steps to them. And we know our kids are very poor at understanding and following and remembering complex instructions and steps. There's going to be new routines to learn, uh, daily schedules may alter and fluctuate, um, and they're not going to be what they're used to. And their executive functioning skills, which are generally also impaired, such things like planning, organization, time management, 
are also going to have much more of a load put on them than these kids have at the best of times. So also their symptoms of hyperactivity and impulsivity are going to trip them up here. A lot of these kids need to move. Um, if they are inhibited uh, from moving around the classroom, they're going to uh, have difficulty. Um, they're going to be much more fidgety and less able to focus and pay attention. And of course, a lot of our kids are very impulsive. Um, and impulsivity in this environment is going to be a huge issue, as I, I'm sure you can understand. Also, our kids have difficulty with what we call self-regulation and emotional regulation. So, you know, this means that they're frustrated more easily. When they are frustrated, they're less able to cope with it. Um, when we put more of a load on their executive functioning skills, um, they're much easier to have, uh, or much quicker to have a um, meltdown. Uh, so all of these things, their self-regulation and emotional regulation uh, impairments are going to cause them great issues in this new environment. Some of the other things um, that are going to cause them issues, um, and particularly for those kids in higher grades, are um, the online learning. Now, some kids in elementary whose parents are choosing uh, for them to stay home uh, will also be doing online um, learning. So some of these points um, pertain to them as well. Um, a while ago, when we went to online learning in April, um, I developed a document looking at um, benefits and difficulties um, our kids with ADHD are going to face with online learning. So that is the link uh, for you there that you can access, but you can also just look under COVID resources and you'll see the document that talks in great detail about online learning. So uh, kids in higher grades, um, a lot of the schools are talking about alternate days. So they may attend school one day, they may be expected to do online learning another day. This is really going to be difficult for them. We know for our kids, um, structure, routine, consistency is the best for them. So these varied schedules and upheaval um, are going to make it more difficult. With online learning, often there's less instruction and less structure around it. Very often they get online and, and uh, read something, get an assignment, but then it's basically up to them, you know, to start to keep their focus and actually produce um, a product at the end of it. They're going to have reduced monitoring, which so that leads to <laughs> procrastination. So we know our kids with ADHD have issues with procrastination at the best of times. So with reduced monitoring, we're probably going to get more issues with procrastination. Also, with nobody there to help chunk down their work. So what chunking down means is when there is a larger assignment, um, breaking it down into smaller pieces, helping them start their assignment, um, you know, break it down into manageable pieces, and then figure out the times that those smaller pieces should be completed for them to um, have the entire assignment done on time. So there's probably going to be less chunking for them if they don't have a teacher uh, working with them. Um, and also, unfortunately, online learning sometimes means that the accommodations that they would get in a classroom setting are easier to ignore. So, those are all the issues, or actually, it's probably just um, the tip of the iceberg on some of the issues these kids are going to face in this new environment. I'm sure as parents, you've uh, thought of a lot of 
individual uh, individualized issues that your child uh, may be facing. So let's now look at um, what this environment and the situation is causing right now. So um, many of the provinces have tasked the school boards and, and schools with deciding on implementing procedures and policy. So this unfortunately leads to a lack of consistency and a lack of transparency, which means each board and sometimes each school is doing uh, something very you know, different. Um, so it's difficult for parents to know exactly what their child is going to be facing when they get back into school. Yet they're being asked if they want their child to go back to school. So they've got insufficient information to make an informed um, decision. And, and that's always a bad situation to be in. So know that you've got the right to be informed about the environment your child is going to go be going back into before you make these decisions. Unfortunately, it's kind of late in the game, and I know schools um, and boards are scrambling, have been scrambling. Um, a lot of them are just putting the final touches on it, and from talking to to some of the boards. Um, they have a game plan, but they're not 100% sure it's going to work exactly as they think it's going to work. So there's a lot of unknowns here. So also know you've got the right to expect your child's needs to be met. So COVID has not suspended your child's right to an equal education. They have a right to their IEP, to accommodations and supports in the school system. That being said, we need to be, you know, somewhat um, cognizant of, you know, the stress um, on the schools right now. Um, they're trying very hard, um, but again, they don't know what, what's going to happen as well. So um, most of the overlying parental concerns uh, right now is, will your child be safe? And second, will your child be given the accommodations and additional supports re they require to navigate this new and confusing environment? So, and if they're not given those supports, what will happen? So I'm not sure if you guys can hear this, but I am actually in a major um, thunderstorm right now. <laughs> so. Hopefully you can't hear the thunder and lightning uh, behind me, but um, okay. So there we'll see. Okay, so um, these are overarching concerns that most parents um, have, and they need they need to be assured by the school that if their child has difficulty navigating this environment, what is going to happen? Are they going to be given more supports or is something else going to be ha happening? So we're suggesting that you contact your school immediately, um, preferably your school principal who's mandated with making sure that kids with special uh, needs are given the support they require, or if you've been working closely with a special ed or a teacher or a, a CERT, um, you get a hold of them. And um, contact um, should be made in hard copy or email so it can be tracked. And there's a reason we suggest that, is that you know after the fact, if things happen and casual discussions are held, it's always easy for people to say they forgot or they didn't, that discussion didn't happen, but there's if there's email to track it or hard copy, um, then uh, everybody knows what was discussed. So some questions uh, which you are going to need answers for. Um, so these are questions you can put in the email um, directly to your principal or special ed teacher or as you go up the hierarchy, uh, which we're gonna talk about in, the, in a minute. So some questions to ask, how is your child's environment going to change? 
right? From what, from what they're used to from last year. Um, so you need to know, is the class going to be larger, smaller? Um, are they going to have the same classmates they've been used to? Are their desks going to be set up in the same way? Is their a daily schedule going to be the same? So all those questions you need to ask. So, and if their schedule is going to be altered, how is it going to be altered? And if it's altered, can you expect for it to remain consistent after it's altered? You also need to know what your child's support level is going to be like when they're returning to the school. Are they going to have the same support, um, same uh, EAs? Um, is the IEP going to be followed as it was um, last year or improved upon? All these questions need to be asked. Um, but also, can you expect additional resources to help them with this environment? Because a lot of these kids are going to struggle and they're going to struggle big time. Is the school ready for that? And do they have additional resources in place or additional resources they can access to help your child navigate the system? And this is a really big question to ask the school. If your child returns to school or when your child returns to school, if they find the environment too challenging or a certain aspects of the environment too challenging or the number of rules difficult to follow because of their ADHD or other impairments, can they get additional support or are they going to be consequenced or are they going to be excluded? So we're going to talk about exclusion um, in some upcoming um, slides, but these are questions you need to be asking your school. So some things you need to request. So you need to ask the school if uh, you and the school can revisit your child's IEP and or behavioral plan. Some kids have behavioral plans as well as, as IEPs. Um, and look at the existing accommodation. And look at any additional accommodations that need to be added to cover these circumstances, okay? This sort of um, unique setting um, that, we're, that we're having right now. Request a Zoom meeting with the school um, to discuss any IEP changes and also talk to the school at this meeting about any strategies that you found uh, have been helpful during these additional times with stress for your child. Um, <clears throat> discuss with the school and decide how the school is going to routinely share with you feedback. Um, so you want feedback on how your child's doing, right? Physically as well as mentally. Do they seem more stressed? Uh, do they seem more impulsive and hyperactive? Um, you know, are they able to social distance and also do the physical things they need to keep them physically well, right? And also discuss um, on any issues that may uh, arise and decide on a way the school can routinely share feedback with you, okay? So is it gonna be an email? Is it gonna be a quick phone call? Um, is it going to be um, your child's um, daily reminder book or um, whatever. Obviously, uh, email is better, especially if your child is old enough uh, to read what's written in the daily reminder book. So, also ask to be informed about the school's exclusion policy. When what does this exclusion mean? So, exclusion means when a principal asks you to alter your school, your child's school day bring them in later, take them home earlier, only have them there for lunch, or to stay home, period. And generally, they use things like lack of resources, we don't have enough staff to deal with your child, your child is being disruptive, they're not following the rules, et cetera, et cetera. And also ask what your school board's policy on school exclusion is. And we're going to go into that in more detail in a minute. 
um, I mentioned about this escalating through a school hierarchy. hierarchy. So um, schools and school boards work similar to military. So what you need to know is there's levels here. So a, for instance, a school board superintendent is never going to speak with you unless you've spoken with the school principal first. And very often a principal doesn't really want to speak to you unless you've tried to work it out with the teacher as well. But you need to go through that hierarchy, but you also need to know you do have the rights to escalate this through the hierarchy. So at the beginning, contact your principal and special education teacher. If you're not getting a timely response or the response you're getting uh, concerns you, um, then you can bump it up to the special education superintendent, which is preferred, or your area superintendent. And then you can go up to the school board's director. But just to caution you, I mean, obviously, it's better to try to get things resolved at lower levels before you escalate. But if you're hitting a brick wall and you're very, very concerned about what's going to be happening with your child, you know, at school, you do have the right to escalate this. Um, and again, if you escalate it to those people and they don't contact you in a timely manner, I mean, obviously not within an hour, right? You have to give them a little while. Um, or you're not receiving appropriate answers, you can contact your school trustee, you can go to your local provincial representative um, in your provincial ministry of education. These are all people who should be accountable to make sure your child is receiving the accommodations they need for their disability. You can actually, if you want to uh, contact, um, you know, more than one person as a, at a time, you can write one brief letter and, uh, you know, you can copy varying uh, other people on that letter. Now we have developed a template letter for you. There's a link there. Um, you can access uh, this actual presentation, which in a document form, it's called the tips for parents there, the link there. Um, so when I'm talking about a simple letter, things like, um, you know, we are concerned about our child returning to school, um, our list of questions are this, and you can actually just cut and paste the list of questions directly off our template letter. Um, you may want to add a, you know, a sentence or two about um, your child, uh, their impairments, whether they are identified as an um, exceptional student or special needs student, if they have an IEP, that kind of thing. But again, you don't have to go into great detail but list the questions that you need answers and also inform them who you've spoken to already or who you've emailed already. Um, in Ontario, we have uh, an organization called ARCH, Disability Law Center, um, which, uh, you know, deals with some of this stuff. And um, actually, ARCH and, um, the OADA, which I'll talk about in a minute, put on a presentation about some of these issues. And if you go to either of their websites, you can link to their presentation on concerns parents have for kids with disability returning to school. And uh, they said that parents can contact ARCH or Justice for Children and Youth in Ontario. And there's also the Ontario Human Rights Commission. If you are in a different province, I suggest, uh, you know, if you are that desperate, if you get to a really, really bad place, you research what's available um, in your province as well. And you, you also have the ability to contact us. So what this school is a school inclusion, exclusion and why should you be concerned about? 
As I mentioned, AODA, Accessibility for Ontario's with Disability Act Alliance, did a report on a school exclusion about a year, year and a half ago. Uh, there's a link to it there, or you can just go to their website and look for uh, the, the document. They also, I believe, did um, a webinar on it that you can access it access but um, in the presentation that AODA and ARCH have done together lately uh, in conjunction with the Ontario Autism uh, Association I believe um, they are very very concerned and have heard a lot of feedback from parents because they expect exclusion to increase um, for kids with special needs in this environment. So in Ontario specifically, in Ontario's Education Act, um, the number is listed there, it states that a principal has the right to exclude a student if in their judgment the student is detrimental to the physical or mental well-being of the pupil. Now, Hearing that, I'm sure you can picture a lot of scenarios that our kids with ADHD could get into where the principal feels that they have a right to exclude um, your child. So again, um, this has been of concern for the last number of years, but we're expecting um, exclusions to increase in this environment. So you need to be aware of it and that's why you need to find out about your school's policy and your board's policy on exclusion so you are prepared. So some other facts about this in Ontario anyway. Schools and boards are not required to keep track of how many students they exclude for how long they exclude them, for what reason they exclude them, or report this information to anyone. So there's no accountability here. They don't have to tell the student or their family the reason the student is being excluded from school, and they don't need to advise them that they have the right to appeal, which they do. So AODA did some investigation and looked at 72, the 72 school boards that we have in Ontario, and only 33 of those 72 boards have a policy on exclusion. And their policies are all over the place. They vary greatly. And the Ontario Ministry of Education has no published policy on this. So that's a little bit of the, the issue we have in Ontario, but I need to let you know that I have in the past had calls from parents in other provinces that are also facing school or their, their children are facing school exclusion. So you need to investigate your province's uh, policy on this and talk to your school about their policy. Um, you need to know if your child is struggling and not um, able to access more resources and support, um, if they're not able to follow all the, the new rules and regulations and schedules, what is your school going to do about it? So you need to be, be prepared if this does come up. So, now let's talk about assisting your child with transitioning back to school. So what can you do to help them transition a little easier? So of course the big thing is going to be obtaining that information, the answers to those questions you're going to be asking. What's their new environment and situation going to look like? How is it going to change from what they're used to? Um, are their schedules going to change? Is there, you know, IEP, the amount of accommodations? Are, is there going to be more staff or less staff to help them? We've just been informed from my grandson's school that uh, an EA has been cut, so there's 
one. There's only one EA now when last year there were two full-time EAs. So go figure, um, you know, uh, there's going to be less resources this year. So again, you need to find those things out. But some things you can do once you know what the environment's going to be like. Talk to your child about the changes they can expect. Prepare them. Talk to them about what it's going to look like. What is their classroom going to look like? Um, what's their schedule going to look like? Are there going to be more kids in the class, less kids in the class? Are their desks all going to be separated in, in far apart? Will they have to wear a mask? Um, are they okay without a mask? All of these things so they know what to expect. And then discuss with them their worries. So the kids are probably going to be vocal about things they do not like changing or things they're worried about. And talk to them about your concerns, that the things that, that um, you're concerned may be issues. Review any added rules um, that are going to be added, like distancing, um, you know, between children, that kind of thing that they're going to be expected to follow. And ask them if they anticipate any difficulties and do you anticipate any difficulties? And find ways to reiterate these rules frequently. Practice them, role play different scenarios, um, you know, that you think are going to um, be a diff difficult situation for them. You can do things like um, develop reminder cards with the, the new schedule on that they can look at frequently. Um, you know, a list of rules and regulations they can remind themselves with, those kind of things. So they at least they go in a little prepared. And if your child has sensitivities or is anxious about wearing a mask, um, and again, it, it's really going to vary be, be, between province, uh, between boards. Um, you know, here the young kids aren't going to have to wear, wear masks, but I believe from grade four and up they are. So it, it really depends um, on your child what they're going to be facing. But again, find out what it is. Um, if they are anxious about this or anxious about seeing others in masks, practice with them, you know, get them to put on a mask, find a mask that they find a little bit um, comfortable, um, you know, rather than kind of grabbing the first thing that morning and finding out that your child is very uncomfortable in, in that mask. Um, get them used to seeing family members and, and other people they know in masks. Um, and also be aware if your child has CAPD, Central Auditory Processing Disorder, wearing a mask and seeing, especially seeing others wearing a mask is going to exacerbate uh, this. So if they're unable to see facial expressions, lip movements, um, any processing problems they have in, in hearing things are going to only uh, be worse. So. Language skills um, is something, or at least a strategy around this, is something you can practice, um, be proactive about. So lots of our kids have reduced expressive language skills, which means basically that they have difficulty expressing themselves, expressing when they're struggling, um, and sometimes even recognizing uh, when they're struggling. But if possible, if you can teach your child the language needing to express when they're struggling, this can help them out. I mean, a lot of our kids find this challenging, but just even teaching them a few simple phrases may be helpful. And again, remember our kids find it very difficult to articulate. So, just simple things like, I'm having a hard time right now. I don't know what I need to do. So these kids may be in a situation where people are barking orders at them. They're, you know, they've got difficulty processing things quickly, reacting quickly. We don't want people interpreting that, um, as they often do, 
that these kids are being defiant rather than just, you know, slow and figuring out what it is they need to do. So if they can just shoot their hand up and say, I don't know what I need to do right now, the teacher will be um, knowledgeable or understand that your child needs some immediate assistance before a meltdown occurs. Um, also just take, telling the teacher, I need to move right now. Some of these kids are very hyperactive, um, are going to feel very constrained sitting in a chair all day, not being able to move, keep their distance from other kids. So a strategy put in place before when they shoot up their hand and say, I really need to move right now or I'm going to run out of the class. Just I need to move is enough to trigger the teacher to know something needs to be done immediately. So when you've developed the strategy, you need to prepare the school about this strategy. So for it to work, the school needs to be informed about this language strategy. And again, if you can inform the school in writing, all the better. So, but also stress to the staff that they will need to pick up on these messages right away consistently and act quickly for the strategy to work. If your child voices one of these, I need help now, a couple of times and nobody reacts to it, they will drop it very quickly. So the staff needs to encourage them, practice with them using this strategy and react to it quickly. And you and the staff need to decide on acceptable interventions for the staff to apply once the message is relayed. So if your child shoots up their hand and says, I'm having a hard time right now, um, have some strategies that work. Uh, is there a quiet place your, can your child can go to safely, right? So you need these strategies to be put in place proactively rather than reactively, because in this environment, um, dealing with these things reactively is going to just make situations much, much worse, okay? And this accommodation, the strategy, should be added to the IEP or behavioral plan and the staff should all know about it. So some other ways to prepare the school for your, trans, your child transition back. Um, and just a bit of a, uh, a warning or heads up or whatever, go into this assuming that the school wants to be informed. They want the information they need that will make the transition smoother. So go in with a positive attitude, hoping they're going to have the same positive attitude, at least from the onset. Okay. So meet with the school. Again, generally, these things are going to be done over a Zoom call and inform them about any skill reduction, anything your, your child was doing well up to, uh, you know, school being stopped but they've now maybe fallen back on or you know they're going to need additional help to get them up to that level again you know but also some kids have found when they've been home there's certain things they've uh, been improved on and parents have been able to um, help them with certain skills the school needs to know you know what they're better at and what they're worse at because it's been five months since they've seen them they need to know if your child's uh, anxiety has increased during the time or they've had any behavioral setback. Um, and they need to know about any issues that you expect may arise in this environment. Again, being forewarned is much better than reacting to a meltdown or something they weren't aware of at the time. Um, and any strategies that you've developed working with your child over these past five months, you've had them, you've had to um, homeschool them or at least do online learning. You've seen them through this sort of crisis and anxiety time with COVID. 
you've probably developed some strategies that works for your child. And the more concrete these strategies are, the better. So your child will be used to these strategies being used. And if you can share it with the school and be consistent in these strategies, the better. So also discuss with the school any triggers that increase your child's stress and any tells. So what's a tell? So a tell is like a visual cue. For, uh, for some kids, as they clench their fists, their face goes red. Some kids just shut down and stop talking. So what is the tell or a visual cue that your, your child's anxiety or their frustration or their ability to self-regulation is, is you know, anxiety is going up, their frustration is going up, their ability to deal with it is tanking. What are the tells that the school needs to be aware of? Just they need to step in now before things get worse, right? And again, strategies, when these tells appear, need to be developed proactively, not reactively. And again, any accommodation strategies around that should be added to your child's IEP or behavioral plan. So, and you need to follow up on these meetings. So, any decisions made during the meeting should be followed up in a written summary. Sometimes the schools are great and they do this for you. They will send you an email saying, you know, thank you for the meeting or discussion. Uh, what was decided was X, Y, and Z. This will be implemented by this day, that type of thing. If not, and schools are going to be pretty busy, you need to follow this up with an email. This doesn't need to be complex. Point form, great. Opening sentence, thank you for meeting, you know, with us on this and this date. Um, our, you know, we believe that our, um, our interpretation or whatever you want to say um, was that these decisions were made. Then just do brief bullet points. Um, and our understanding is that these will be implemented by this and this date. And it's also good um, to follow at, at the end of this email just put a little sentence saying, um, we would like a follow-up meeting scheduled in two weeks um, because you need to review if these strategies are working. These kids are individuals. What works for one won't necessarily work for another or what you think will work for them doesn't always work. So having strategies in place that aren't working are useless, right? So you need a follow-up meeting and from time to time, several follow-up meetings to tweak these strat strategies and improve on them and put things in place um, that are gonna work. So there also needs to be some follow-up work on, on IEPs and, and every fall, uh, your child should receive a new IEP. And unfortunately, the way the system works in all provinces, this is just reality. Parents are usually the ones who are required to ensure that IEPs are implemented and strategies are working. I remember talking to a special education teacher who said in her decades of teaching, she never ever had a principal or superintendent come to her class and question her as to how and when the IEPs were, uh, the, the accommodations on the IEPs were implemented. So this is what we suggest, even in times when COVID is not an issue, meet with your child's teacher every couple of months. It doesn't have to be super serious, but you need to kind of have a face-to-face -face meeting or in this case, a Zoom meeting. Have the IEP in front of you, have the teacher have the IEP in front of her, and ask how certain accommodations are being implemented and how they're working. If the teacher gives you a blank look and does not, is not able to answer how that accommodation was implemented and how it worked, then you know the IEP has not been implemented and those strategies have, have not been put in place. 
ask, also ask for examples of how accommodations are not working, because this is not going to be perfect. And remember an IEP or whatever your province calls it, IEP stands for Individual Education Plan. They're called different things in different provinces, but it's, it's basically an individualized plan that lists your child, um, you know, strengths and weaknesses, um, the goals they expect of them and the accommodations they, the school is going to put in place to help your child meet those goals, right? You don't just want goals for your child in an IEP and a cut and paste of, you know, different things like a word chart or whatever that, you know, are posted in classroom. You want individual accommodations for your child. So you also want to discuss which accommodations were tried but didn't work very well. Because the next question you're going to ask is, okay, what are we going to put in place instead of that accommodation that didn't work? Because IEPs are living, breathing documents. They're supposed to be improved on, uh, review, reviewed, revised frequently, and improved on to make them the best IEP we can get. So that's basically the end of my presentation, but I did list some resources for you here um, to assist you with IEPs. So I've developed charts on, uh, for elementary, there's teaching strategies for typical ADHD executive functioning, in, uh, typical ADHD and executive functioning impairment. So this is a chart that lists um, problems, issues a child may have in a classroom, things like if instructions are given, they're not able to start the assignment, um, and different accommodations that are appropriate for that difficulty. But I believe there's a list of almost 30 of them um, on that list. But for each difficulty, there's five or six different accommodations listed. So there's a variety of them for the variety of students that we have, right? Um, so it's sort of a, what do you think will work? Try that first and then you can always move to a different one. There's also a chart um, that lists ADHD uh, symptoms, um, how those symptoms uh, can cause impairments in the classroom setting and the appropriate accommodations for those impairments. Um, a lot of teachers like these charts, but parents also find them very, very helpful in um, developing an IEP. And remember, as a parent, you have the right to have input into the IEP. You can ask for things to be removed and things to be added, okay? so. These charts, sit down, go through it. If your child's old enough, sit with them and, and ask them, do you have problems when the teacher gives an assignment? Do you know what you need to do, how you need to start? If you do, then if you start, are you able to continue working on it? Can you keep your focus without being distracted? What kinds of things distract you? Do you know how to do step one, but not step two? These are all things that are really, really common for our kids and they're broken down into this uh, chart with appropriate accommodations. And again, there's the same type of chart for high school and there's the same type of chart for post-secondary. Remember, students in post-secondary have rights and sometimes it's actually easier to get accommodations for kids with ADHD in post-secondary. Um, and we actually do have a drop down on our website under in education, understanding ADHD in education post-secondary and you'll see a whole list of documents including this chart but also uh, documents on uh, their rights in post-secondary. Okay, I'm going to end that there, and we're going to see if we've got some questions that have come up. So the first question is about uh, IEP. Uh, should we initially request an IEP that has been adjusted to adapt recommendations to uh, new COVID reality? 
So what I'd suggest is um, you have a meeting with the school where you both have the IEP in front of you. Um, and you discuss whether what is on that IEP is going to be sufficient for your child in this environment. Some kids have got very thorough, comprehensive IEPs, but I must admit the, the majority don't, right? So at looking at the IEP, if you have concerns that there are things missing from that IEP, supports missing that you're pretty sure your child is gonna need in this environment, uh, you know, get on the phone, email the school immediately and say, we need to review the IEP immediately because we are concerned that our child is not going to be successful in this environment unless we have additional things added to the IEP. Okay, thank you. So the next question is also IEP. So how do we get um, an IEP for a student? For a ah. Okay, so a lot depends on which province you're in because each province has a different system of special education and how they recognize or don't recognize students with ADHD. Um, Ontario, BC, and Quebec have a system of, um, trying to remember the term now, uh, where they basically recognize students as exceptional students um, with a disability. Now, that being said, um, in Ontario, it's through what we call an IPRC process. And, and again, we have webinars on all of this on our website. If you go to past webinars, and there's webinars on school advocacy that explains all of this. We also have uh, documents um, on our website. There's a chart on the different provinces and how every province recognizes or does not recognize a student with ADHD. But in Ontario, even when they have this system of needing to recognize a student um, under an IPRC, we stand for Identification Placement Review Committee, they will do IEPs for students without an IPRC. And unfortunately, in Ontario, BC, and Quebec, they do not have a category which they recognize ADHD in to date. So that students with just ADHD or ADHD without a learning disability or without autism are not generally officially recognized under a category. But I know in Ontario and sometimes in BC, I'm not quite sure about Quebec, they can get an IEP without that. But just so you know, an IEP without uh, an IPRC recognition behind it is fully at the school's discretion. They can pull it whenever they want. But the key to, to this, to getting an IP, IEP, is being able to demonstrate to the school that your child is um, not being successful academically, not working to the potential, is struggling. Unfortunately, schools very often work to a level of basically is is it okay it, to, to a level of not failing, right? If the, if the student is failing, well, they're doing okay and they don't need an IEP. That is not true. Um, some of our most greatest students are the ones who need an IEP um, the most to be able to meet their potential. But unfortunately, it's a, it's a hard slog. Now, that's probably a two hour presentation on its own, but we do have a presentation or a, it's a group of three presentations on that on our past webinars that you can access, um, which deals with school advocacy. And we're also going to be dealing with that in our upcoming uh, conference as well. I'm going to be doing a, a presentation on that. Okay, thank you, Heidi. Uh, we have one uh, person asking that the son is attending a private post secondary school. So um, any advice on how to approach um, going back to school as well? Yeah, so it's a little more difficult in a, in a private post-secondary school 
public post-secondary schools are mandated um, to meet human rights of these students. Now, that being said, a private school should also be paying attention to their students' human rights. ADHD is recognized as a disability. A student in post-secondary has the right and very often their rights are more recognized because they are adults, generally, once they're 18. Um, they have the right for accommodations for their disability, okay? So um, as I mentioned earlier, if you look at our website, um, under Understanding ADHD in Education, you'll see a drop-down for post-secondary. That explains the entire system. There is a document we developed, a policy paper on this. Uh, you can use that policy paper. Everything we put on our website is under a Creative Commons um, copyright, which means you can print it, you can share it, as long as you don't use it for commercial purposes or to take our logo off. Um, you know, or change it in any way. But those documents will explain to the school what the rights are of your uh, child in the post-secondary setting. Obviously, they're, they're going to want the student to do the, the advocating, but we know our kids, even at post-secondary, are not often good at this. But, um, you know, also, um, I developed a toolkit uh, called Transitioning to Post-Secondary, which you can also access on our website, which takes you through these steps, all these things you need to do step by step. Okay, thank you. So uh, with regards to elementary child with a learning disability and um, ADHD, what rights do we have in terms of requesting additional class support? So um, a child who has a learning disability plus ADHD should not have any difficulties getting that um, recognition as an exceptional student because learning disabilities is under one of their categories. It's under the communication category. So if your child's been diagnosed as a learning disability and they don't have uh, official recognition, or the word they're called, we call it IPRC, if you're in um, Ontario, other provinces, generally all recognize learning disabilities um, as acceptable, you need to send a letter to the school principal, tell them uh, you, um, you know, in Ontario, you ask for an IPRC meeting. Again, this is all explained in these webinars. But in other provinces, you basically have to request it, ask for it. They may ask for documentation. Um, you will have to have some type of testing and report from a psychologist for the learning disability, maybe documentation of the ADHD documentation. They will actually tell you what they need, but you need to request this. Um, and if they've got an existing IEP, you have the right for the IEP to be reviewed and changed um, at any time. Okay, thank you. Um, also on IEP, uh, I'm not sure which province, maybe Quebec. Um, so this person has a document called, um, excuse me, my French pronunciation, plan adaptations. Uh, so accommodation plan. Um, it doesn't include uh, adjustment to the curriculum. Is that the same as an IEP? Yeah. So um, actually, um, if we have what's called a modification um, on an IEP, uh, red lights should go off. So modification or adjustment to curriculum means the child is not functioning at grade level. So you don't want to see adjustment to curriculum. It means your child's not, not working at grade level. So the curriculum is being altered. What you want to see is accommodation. Right? Accommodations means they're functioning at that grade level, but things are being accommodated. So 
the way the child is taught, the teaching, the teaching strategies, are they repeating instructions, chunking work, helping time manage um, your child with time management, more reminders, all those kind of things. Then we have accommodations to environment. So is your child um, able to sit beside the teacher, right? Are they able to write tests and exams in a quiet spot? Those things are accommodations. And then there's accommodations around testing. So if they have difficulty doing a lot of handwriting, are they allowed to use the computer doing tests or exams? Are they allowed to uh, do oral testing? All those kind of things. So generally, accommodations are in instruction or teaching, environment, and testing, right? Again, all of this stuff is, is, is on our website, um, and it and explains the different types of accommodations. Um, so uh, again, um, you need to ask uh, for an IEP, but if you see the word, and I'm sorry, I don't know the, the word in French, modification or that your curriculum is being changed, you need to start asking a lot of questions. What grade level is my child functioning? They should be able to tell you what grade they are in math, in uh, you know English comprehension and reading and all of those things. They should be able to break it down for you and how they're altering their curriculum and to what grade level. Okay, thank you. So next question, going back to the previous IEP question, um, what um, rights do we have to additional people resources beyond IEP? So. Um, okay, so, um, so generally these questions come up around, does my child have a right to a part-time or a full-time uh, EA educational assistant, um, that type of thing. Generally, kids don't have rights to a specific resource, uh, per se. The school has to apply for um, EA time, and for a child to have a full-time or even a part-time EA assigned specifically to them, the impairments have to be pretty specific because we just don't have these resources in our school systems, right? But, um, you know, they do have a right to accommodations. Obviously, um, if there's issues with, you know, disruptive behavior, they're going to get EA support more quickly. Unfortunately, that's the reality of things um, in our school system. You know, they have difficulty, you know, great difficulty, and understandably so, dealing with disruptive behavior. Um, you know, and also if your child really just is not able to function, then yes, they will have more EA time. Also, it depends on how many um, disabilities your child has, but what their profile is, right? So if you're dealing with multiple disabil disabilities and, multi and disabilities in different areas, so you may have a physical disability with a neurodevelopmental dis disability combined, then there's a greater chance that you're actually going to, to have an EA. So again, these things are not in black and white. And even the Human Rights, the Ontario Human Rights Commission says they don't have the right to dictate exactly what resources your child needs. Just that they have the right to resources and accommodations that they need to access the curriculum and receive an education and to the level of undue hardship, okay? So if a school can prove um, what you're asking for would be, you know, undue hardship for the school board, then, okay, it seemed, it seemed as unreasonable. But some school boards have been mandated even to purchase resources from other school boards if they don't have it. So it is a pretty high, high bar. Again, you want to go into this discussion being reasonable, but also being knowledgeable um, about your your rights 
and you can't tell them, you know, you listen to this webinar, you listen to the webinars on school advocacy, you know, what your rights are. Schools stand up and pay more attention to, to parents that they know are knowledgeable about how the special education and school system work and what their rights are. Thank you. Uh, so we have uh, four more questions. Okay. Um, yeah. So, uh, uh, what is your recommendation on how to start this process if the child was recently diagnosed? Oh, okay. So um, I, I'm going to assume your child's been recently diagnosed with ADHD. Um, so it really depends on what province you're in because some provinces have a system of what they call inclusion, which means the kids with special needs are not actually identified under a certain category. It's just mandated that the school principal has to meet the needs of special education um, students. So again it, it's contacting the school it's sharing uh, documentation from your medical um, experts and again you have you should con um, have full control of what documents you're sharing with the school and not if you have a document from a psychologist or a physician that includes personal family information that you want left out that you don't think is going to help the school at all but you don't want to share you can ask the medical professional to produce a document for you to share with the school okay but the school needs that documentation to recognize um, you know your child as a student with special needs you're then going to have to sit down, um, you know, and and talk to them about what the special needs are. Any anything you can give them, any reports from a speech and language pathologist, from occupational therapist, uh, anything on cap disorder from a audiologist, anything you have to show that your child has special needs and also you need to show the school is struggling academically or behaviorally, right? And very often this means educating the school on your child's disability. Do not expect that educators automatically understand ADHD and understand it as a medical disorder and a disability. And again, all of those documents that you may need to support this are easily accessible um, on our website. And the process in each province, you can look up, there is a chart, which is uh, our 2010 report card on uh, the different provinces and how they recognize and don't recognize ADHD and it explains explain, it's brief but it explains how the system works in your province and then you have to get on your provinces um where you the province each province will have something on their special education how the system works in your province so you're going to have to educate it, it it's basically going to be a multi hour presentation if i go into each province province so you're going to have to be a little proactive but remember that's what CADAC's here for you can also email us um, you know with those questions individually thank you so next question uh, my son was due to have a school support team meeting in April and that was cancelled so how would you bring this up with the principal and have you heard anything about cancelled IPLC and uh, school support teams uh, someone else is also asking what is IPRC. Okay, so IPRC is a, I'll start there, is a term we use in Ontario, which stands for Identification Placement Review Committee. It's a stupid acronym and, and nobody can remember it, but it basically means um, somebody from your school, somebody from the board meets with you, um, because parents have requested or the school has requested this meeting 
because the child is struggling. So it's a process where we identify students as exceptional students. And once they are identified, it gives them the right to special education resources to the end of high school, okay? Um, different provinces have different systems, um, you know, where they uh, do this kind of thing. BC, unfortunately, uh, we're rewriting the guidelines to special education. They were going to recognize the ADHD. Then you had a change in political party. So that was all scrapped. And your province is now talking about going to the inclusive model, whether or not, but, but you're stuck in limbo right now. You're still recognizing students under categories and ADHD is in, not in one of those categories. So in BC, it's very difficult to get an IEP even for a student with, um, ADHD, with ADHD alone. If your child has autism and ADHD, it's a slam dunk. <laughs> and if your child has a learning disability and ADHD, it's usually a slam dunk, which is a very sorry state of affairs. Uh, sorry, what was the other question, um, Fiona? Um, so, in I, yes. what is an IP, IPRC and? The other question is my son um, uh, was supposed to have a school oh, the team meeting. meeting in the, yeah. Right, right. How so, a team meeting generally means um, people at the team, generally classroom teacher, special education teacher, Principal, it may be also somebody from the board they're calling in. Sometimes they have behavioral special, um, specialist or um, somebody from the uh, psychology department come in. It generally doesn't involve the parents, but I always recommend to parents that they ask to be involved in the team meeting if they can. Um, and again, this IPRC meeting generally happens in April or May. And it is th these meetings where we declare these students as special needs. And an IPRC meeting has to occur every year at about the same time to review them. So if these have been canceled um, as early as possible, I would contact the school principal, um, ask for a date when you can expect the team meeting and the IPRC meeting to happen. So they do need to get back to you on this uh, relatively quickly. I, you know, I'm talking a couple of weeks, um, you know, with, with at least a date. Now, the meeting may not happen within those two weeks. They're pretty stressed right now, but they at least need to give you a date for when this meeting um, will occur. Okay, thank you. So um, one question is, if my son is having difficulty in class, uh, can the school mandate that the son do e-learning, which is worse for him? Oh, do sort of online learning. Yeah. Um, no, again, that is a way of excluding your son from the classroom. So I would anticipate if your child is struggling in the classroom, they may struggle more with online learning. It depends, it's individual. And this is something you're gonna to have to sit with your child, if your child's old enough, to discuss this, um, you know, and basically say, you know, which is the, the less evil option here, right? If your child doesn't want to be back in the school environment, Maybe, you know, that is the choice there. But if you, the, the school brings this up uh, and says, no, no, we think it's better that your child do online learning, the first question I would have is, what accommodations, additional accommodations are you going to put in place if you are asking my child to do online learning? The last thing you want is for your child to do online learning and not have any interaction with the teacher. The teacher not be there to help them through, chunk their work, um, answer questions, 
um, and somebody to hold them accountable. So if they're online learning, you know, there's got to be the teacher's got to say, okay, in two days' time, I expect to see, you know, one page of math questions or whatever, uh, you know, two page essay or whatever the assignment is, but mm -hmm. that there are very concrete accommodations and deadlines and ways to hold your child accountable. And of course, they're going to have to involve the parents in this as well, because if your child is learning from home exclusively, um, I don't see how you're not going to have to get involved somewhat at least. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So two more questions. Um, one is um, if the child is on modif modification based on uh, for most subjects, should you be looking at getting that changed back to accommodation and is modification bad? So you need, you need to have a chat with the school on this. So <laughs> modification is not necessarily good or bad, but it should set some red lights flashing for you. So it basically means, I, I just talked to a parent the other day, their child is in grade three going into grade four. And when I read the IEP, it said they were functioning at a you know senior kindergarten grade one level of reading and math. That is significantly concerning because the question I would have as a parent is, if you are modifying my child's curriculum and they're not functioning at grade level, what are you doing to bring my child up to grade level, right? Is the school uh, basically happy to have your child functioning at below grade level? So as they go up in the years, they're always going to be below grade level unless the school is doing something, has um, doing a special reading program, uh, extra tutoring, math, whatever it is that they need to do, and they need to give you a timeline. So if your child is having their curriculum modified now, you need to know by when the school expects your child to be up to grade level and what are they doing to get your child there. Okay, so unfortunately some schools are happy to what we call warehouse these kids, have them function at below grade level and just keep giving them easy enough work so they don't have to accommodate and support these kids and use up resources to help the child get the grade level. You shouldn't be happy with that. Okay, so last question um, and this is uh, in Ontario. Uh, my daughter is going to be attending uh, online classes for grade nine. Uh, will she be able to access help for academic needs or will the schools be uh, only providing help for in-class in students? So she has an IEP and a psychoeducational assessment done uh, where her needs were outlined. Okay, so according to <laughs> um, our provincial government um, and uh, school boards, um, the kids with IEPs with special needs should be receiving all the same accommodations when they're doing online um, schooling, okay? So just because they're doing online education, it doesn't mean the responsibilities of the school to meet her special needs stops, okay? They may need to be altered somewhat, right? Because the teacher may not be in front of her all the time. But then you need to set, set other times. So maybe every other day at a certain time of day, the teacher is going to get online with her on Zoom or whatever um, and be able to uh, answer her questions, help her chunk down her work, uh, help her time manage her assignments to say, okay, by this date, you, say you should have this much done. That can all be done online just as well as it can be done face-to-face. -face. But 
you are going to have to be proactive and talk with a special education uh, teacher and her teachers to make sure things are being put in place. Okay, thank you. So uh, thank you for all the questions and the answers. So this is the end of our webinar tonight. Um, you will be receiving an email with uh, tonight's recording and uh, that should be sent in uh, from two to three business days. So if you don't get that email by Tuesday, please uh, take a look in your spam box just in case it got there. Um, the other uh, item is our annual conference, which uh, Heidi had mentioned uh, tonight. Um, so our annual conf ADHD conference will be taking place on uh, October 17th and 18th. So there will be two days and eight sessions together. Um, for tonight's uh, registration, registered um, uh, users will be offering an exclusive 10% discount for those who register tonight. So the details for the conference will be included in the email as well. So once again, thank you for coming tonight. Um, I hope this is useful for you all. Um, if you have questions, uh, send them to communications at CADDAC.ca and uh, we'll get back to you on that. Um, thank you once again and good night everyone. Good night. Thank you.